Billy did very well to be 27 not out at the close of play. After that ball, there were two overs and one run to take it up to 248 for five. Very fine performance from Martin Moxon, 74, 62 to Gower and Hadley, four for 53 from 25 overs and eight maidens. Brace for the other wicket at a cost of 65. 26 overs and 8 maidens for him. A very good performance from Bracewell and Gray when in the session between T and Stumps they managed to tie down the batsmen, frustrate them and did a great job to allow Hadley to rest before he came back with the second new ball. Morning of the second day, not all that good. Uh, the light wasn't uh, too crash hot I'm afraid and uh, there were a few spots of rain which uh, brought frowns to the forwards not only of the players but uh, the administrators and treasurers as well. Play got away on time though. We pick it up now with the fifth ball of the second over. Three runs have been added. Richard Hadley is the bowler and Peter Willey is taking strike. <laughs> the outfield has been slowed a little by the overnight rain. Third man goes down now. This is Edmonds now. Well, that was just about unplayable, I reckon. wickets for Hadley once again 26 times and the sixth time against England and he's bowled quite superbly this morning Edmonds was good enough to get the edge of the bat onto that which was no mean feat I can tell you again the perfect line and Edmonds has tried to get forward he's got his weight forward but the ball has bounced and it's left him and uh, Martin Crowe has taken a real slippery little catch there. Bruce French is the new batsman. Five for 56. Richard Hadley from 26.1. Oh dear. Well, we've managed to avoid the rain. Now we've got a problem with the light. And uh, it would be bad enough to be facing any bowler in that light. Richard Hadley steaming in at you from the pavilion end. In all, 27 minutes was lost for bad light. It's not really deterred Richard Hadley. 248 for five was the overnight score, now 258 for six. At the moment, we have a fresh Hadley. Ball still only 12 overs old. Bowling to Bruce French. Well, Bruce French getting in a muddle there. He's taking his eye off the ball. The ball banged in short. Now he's turned his head away. And uh, let's hope it didn't hit him in too painful a spot. Well, it's hit him just above the wrist there, so that's not going to be much fun within a half hour or so when the bruising starts to take hold. Oh, that was a nasty one from Bruce by Bruce French, that is. Interesting, too, that um, it's quite dazed that Richard Hadley owes a great deal of his success to Bruce French, who's his keeper at Nottingham. That caught him right at the back of the head, really unsteady on the feet. And I think there's some good advice. Sit down, quite dazed. And some blood is going. Poor Bruce French. So, Bruce French uh, turned his head away and it's given him a real crack on the head. He was 
quite conscious to start with and, and he obviously felt pretty giddy. Well, that's a very difficult manoeuvre there. It's hardly the right equipment. thought it would be much more suitable to have a old fashioned stretcher to head back. So in comes Graham Dilly. Appeared to bowl even quicker. That uh, really zipped through. Short, rising, and that uh, cracked through the fingers of Ian Smith, the keeper. Lucky this was going down the leg side as far as Graham Dilly was concerned. Watson to Willie. Overslips. Just a little bit of luck to uh, Peter Willie there. For Watson, just cleared slips. <laughs> and that's it. Well, for Willie Watson, first Test match wicket for Willie Watson. It's the reward for steady line. And good length, that he's really happy about that. It took a long time coming, but Watson trapping Peter Woolley right in front there. And uh, seemed to cause Peter Woolley some pain. That ball crashed into those damaged old knees, but it's a valuable contribution from Peter Woolley on his return to the England side. Well, 20 years old, your first test wicket and at Lord's. Neil Foster is England's next man in. Neil Foster. Another good shout. has picked up two. Well, if the first one was pleasant, that one will have been sheer delight. 285 for eight, and um, it would be difficult to say on Foster's behalf that he was really close to the line of the ball there with that front foot. A very airy fairy. And he won't have endeared himself to Graham Dilly, who's uh, manfully fended off Richard Hadley at the other end. Beautifully timed shot racing away to the boundary at mid-wicket. Oh, that'll do nicely, thank you. Just every now and again, Willie Watson seems to neglect his usual in-swing and bowl one goes the other way, but it seems to give the batsman a lot of room. And Neil Rav has really swung the bat at that. And there's only one place for it, four to the cover boundary by the tavern. 
He's certainly some workhorse, Hadley. He uh, opened the bowling at this end, 11 o'clock this morning. Here we are going on 2 o'clock. I know there was an interval, but here he is, still bowling away. 25 overs overnight, another... Now he's into his 12th over today. And that's the 300 up. It's a no-ball called, but also one run to Graham Dilley. England 300 now for the loss of eight wickets. And we've just entered the afternoon session, the second day. Oh, cracking shot. So Neil Radford moving his right foot across nicely into line and still picking off that half volley through the mid-on area. That's it, Graham Dilley's out and the bales are off, umpire Whitehead takes off the bales. It's a sixth wicket to Richard Hadley, well caught by Ian Smith. That's a tremendous effort by Richard Hadley. And Richard Hadley is taking six wickets against England for the third time. He has a magnificent performance once again from Richard Hadley. For the third time, six wickets against England. The last one going down to him there in that total of 307. The bowling figures bearing out. What a marvellous job he's done. 37.5 overs, 11 maidens, six for 80. And great support from young Willie Watson making his debut here in Test cricket. A very nerve-wracking business. Good support all the way through for Richard Hadley and for the acting captain, John Wright. Two for 70 from 30 overs and seven maidens. So a fine performance from the New Zealanders there, able to demolish England in the end after England had made such a good start at the beginning of the match, having won the toss. Well, problems for England were compounded by the fact that Bruce French was hit by Richard Hadley the news from the dressing room was that uh, he was okay, but he'd had a couple of stitches in a cut on the back of his head, and he wouldn't be keeping wicket. In fact, Bill Athey was given the gloves, and uh, here he is coming out now with the England side, led by Mike Gatting. We pick up play in the second over of the New Zealand innings. Foster is the bowler, one run added, and that is a dilly no ball. Neil Foster then from the nursery end to Bruce Edgar. Oh, well taken, Bilathi. And that was a wide. Well, this is a nasty one. That's a wide. And look at that lovely take by Bilathi. Well, there's a remarkable sight. That's Bob Taylor, the former England wicketkeeper, rushing out to the rescue of his country yet again. His last test match was in Lahore. 24th of March, that was in 1984, and that really is an extraordinary sight. Bob Taylor, whose job at Test Matches really is to uh, work with the Cornhill Insurance Company, looking after their guests, their many guests who come to enjoy the day out. And I just wonder where he was when he got the call. He might well have been uh, enjoying a good lunch. And this connection we ought to mention, the uh, sporting gesture of Jeremy Coney, the New Zealand captain who gave the OK when Mike Gatting asked if Bob Taylor should stand in for the injured Bruce French. And if anyone else gets injured out there, Ted Dexter will be called upon to take the field. Graham Dilley, who comes in to bowl to John Wright. edge back onto the stumps nothing surprising about that in view of all the things that have been happening here at Lord since lunchtime just a perfectly normal dismissal so John Wright normally the, the safest of openers I don't know whether he was bemused by the wiki keeping changes his concentration 
diminished, but he wound up half playing at that ball, half playing, half leaving. Eventually, the ball just cannon into the inside edge and onto the leg stump. And to join Bruce Edgar, we're going to have uh, Ken Rutherford. Nought, nought, nought. Not so good so far for New Zealand, although there are two on the board by way of extras. Disastrous for New Zealand. Delia struck twice. Once inside edge of Wright's bat onto the leg stump when he was trying to pull the bat away. And now Rutherford, outside edge, caught Gooch, bowled Dilly. So well bowled Graham Dilly and well juggled Graham Gooch. Graham Dilly getting his away swing absolutely in the right spot. Now, not incredible. Tic Tac men on the balcony having a field day. Bob Taylor is 45 years of age. Probably made him feel as though he was 55. Well, there's one thing, Richie, they haven't gone down against his name. A really wide, wild delivery from Neil Foster. It's one of the more extraordinary little sessions of play I've been mixed up in for many, many years. There is the card, naught, 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 naught. Nine extras, total nine for two. And a 45-year-old wicketkeeper standing at the pavilion end, who wasn't actually in the England squad. Neil Radford is to be the new bowler. Handsome stroke. Unmistakably, Martin Crow loves to stand up into those drives. Very much the hallmark of Martin Crowe's play. The straight drive, that one just going on the onside of the stumps. <laughs> well, freedom we played. Back for just straying in line and an expert nudge from Martin Crowe. Graham Dilly is placed very wide at long leg. Martin Crow able to get that one fine, and it races away to the fence. Four more overs were bowled up to the tee interval, but uh, only four runs added to take the score up to 30 for two. Martin Crow already showing some good form and playing one or two handsome strokes to be 15 not out. Well, during the tee interval, the players had the honor of being presented to Her Majesty the Queen, one man well enough to be out there, for that uh, very pleasurable moment was Bruce French and one man who I'll bet uh, anything didn't believe he would ever go through this moment of pleasure again was Bob Taylor. Alan Whitehead, one of the umpires and a man who uh, meets his queen I think for the second time in several days because he went to the palace to receive the MBE on Tuesday. Dickie Bird. Gadding led the two teams in three cheers for Her Majesty. When the players came back on the field after the tea interval, Peter Willey was off, he sustained a knee injury, and Roland Butcher was fielding a substitute for him. We pick up the action now. The last ball of the fifth over, eight runs have been added, and it's Graham Dilly coming in. Martin Crowe is taking strike. Good time stroke. I think on the 
replay, you might see there's almost no follow through with that stroke. 42 for two, 20 to Crow. Of the finest of contemporary batsmen. Seven to Bruce Edgar, one of the more stubborn. And 42 on the board for New Zealand. Edmonds to bowl. Take all that back. And the Royal Standard comes down to indicate Her Majesty the Queen has uh, left this great ground. Marvellous thrill for all the players to be presented to her during the tea interval. Neil Foster, the bowler from the pavilion end. up in 152 balls for New Zealand after a disastrous start where a string of noughts on the scorecard, nought for Wright, nought for Rutherford, Edgar was not, not out and so too Crow. And it's still to be Edmonds from the nursery end. That's a good shot. Edgar's waited so patiently for the bad ball. And now when it's come, short outside off stick. He has just the right shot for it. Well stopped, sir. Is it a memory game, or is he really as fit as he looks? Terrific work by the veteran Bob Taylor. Not quite understood the point of Edmonds bowling over the wicket to the right-hander. Always seems to me to be a, a variation worth a try, but he's uh, looking for a bit of bite in the bowler's rough outside Martin Crowe's leg stump. But the only bite he gets, I'm afraid, is off the middle of the bat. This is a surprising move by Phil Edmonds, Tony. Bowled so beautifully around the wicket in the Edgbaston Test match against the Indians. That was the flighted ball from Phil Edmonds, but it was well read by Bruce Edgar. He used his feet. He didn't quite get the power into the stroke that he wanted, but still it was well placed. Well, he got his four in the end. Radford to Edgar. Good work again by Philippe Edmonds. Neil Radford's got his line much better organized now finding the edge of Bruce Edgar's bat and another fine stop by the Middlesex left arm spinner oh yes Superbly. Very good example for all aspiring batsmen. As Martin Crow goes to his 50, and he does earn the rich applause. Someone's prevailed upon Neil Radford now to put an extra man on the on side. The three there on the leg side now. Mid on and mid wicket and long leg. 
Oops, and that's the one he wanted, but it went quickly. That was a very good effort by Graham Gooch. Had a genuine edge. It flew away there. So no luck for Neil Radford. Very fast flying edge. Past Graham Gooch. The second slip. The New Zealand 100 coming up. Graham Dilly. And there is a half century for Bruce Edgar. Another delightful stroke. He played a couple of on drives in the last uh, two or three overs. Which uh, certainly gave the indication that he's running properly into form. And that's it for the second day of this test match. Graham Dilly bowling the last ball of the day. Martin Crowe is 52 not out. Precisely the same score credited to Bruce Edgar. Well, Bob, when you last played for England in Pakistan in 84, you must have felt you made your last contribution to the test match scene. Well, I did, Peter, obviously. Um, I mean, I retired two years ago and uh, just happened to be here working for Cornhill when uh, the call came out. How did you get the call? Where were you? I was having lunch with the Cornhill guests and um, the phone went and Gordon Jenkins in charge of the indoor school. He said Mike Gatting wants a word with you. So a... I thought he wanted some wiki-keeping voice for um, <laughs> Bill Athey or... But what a super gesture by Jeremy Coney. Yeah, it's very good. I think it's, um, it's a compliment to Jerry. He's a good sportsman and uh, because I don't think it's every captain would have agreed to it. What about the kit? Did, have you got your own? How do you uh, know? Yes, my gloves were in the car back at the hotel and um, one of the fellas went back and got them out of the car and I, I used Bruce's gloves to start with mm -hmm. and then uh, got into my own. Your own gloves then? Oh, yes, yes. And do you negotiate a special daily fee for these appearances? Uh, <laughs> I haven't got around to that. <laughs> I was just happy to get out there. I'm sure he was delighted to be out there. One of nature's gentlemen, Bob Taylor. Although, uh, I must say that New Zealand captains have always been more accommodating than their Australians just across the water. The card at the close of play, 127 for two. Each of those two men, Bruce Edgar and Martin Crowe, on 52 and two ducks there. John Wright and Ken Rutherford, you couldn't get away to a worse start than that. 127 for two at the close. I thought Graham Dilly bowled particularly well today. He's looking very, very good so far as the Tour of Australia is concerned. He's working up good pace and getting a lot of bounce. You know, Foster was accurate. Radford done for 24. Edmonds, I thought, bowled much better than that. 13 overs, none for 44. Gooch bowled six overs. And New Zealand at the close of play on the second day of this Cornhill Test match, 180 runs behind. With eight wickets in hand, it is still a very, very nicely poised game for the possibility of a shower.